Hello and welcome to the British Sitcom History Podcast. You're about to listen to part two of our look at the rag trade. If you haven't listened to part one yet, you should probably go back and check that out first. We've already talked about the likes of Miriam Carlin and Sheila Hancock, so you don't want to miss that. We're in the middle of discussing the episode French Fashions, in which the workers are pretending to be French in order to impress an American buyer. C'est très bon. So we're going straight back into that. Enjoy. Let's get back into the plot of our episode then, our French fashions episode. Tell us where mm-hmm. we were. Carol has modelled the trousers for the American and they have been found out. The American was like this really big deal. Was that <laughs> yeah. in 1961 doing business with an American? Was that a big thing? Was well, that I like guess exotic? A, not just exotic, is it? It's a very lucrative trade deal. But I do like that when Paddy is negotiating a rate, negotiating a rate for Carol to do the modelling... He says it's an American. He's like, oh, an American. Well, that'll be danger money as well then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah but, well, this is only 16 years after the war. All those GIs coming over here with their nylons and their loose <laughs> They do model uh, the trousers. Uh, Carol manages to walk across a room. Again, another stock in trade for this. Um, people desperately trying to explain weird things that are going on. Uh, with improvised (laughs) stories. So Fenner says that she can't walk with the trousers on because she's a stander-upper model, not a walk-arounder model. It's a union thing, thing. yeah. (laughs) She's she's not on a rate for walking around. (laughs) But of course they they are discovered. And so they lose the deal. Then we cut back to the the workshop, which actually, interestingly enough, Everything in the show is is on set. There's no location shooting. Didn't do that back in those days. Where even in like Steptoe and Son, they have the occasional film inserts uh, yeah. of uh, him out on the on the wagon or whatever. None of that in here at all. But I think they do a really good job to. They keep it all so enclosed in there. We ne- we never have to get out. We never have to see Fenner in his house or anything like that. So it's all fine. Uh, yeah. So they go we back at the office and Reg, uh, the uh, the cutter. Foreman, he suggests, look, these Americans want French workers. We can all pretend to be French. And hilarity ensues. So that is part two of the episode. And to be fair, of all the ways you could go with this, as in sitcom nonsense, they're going to pretend to be French. I think they do a pretty good job of it. We managed to get about six different French stereotypes out of each they other. Did. <laughs> well, what I liked about this, it was like a variety show. So we get the explanation. So Reg is, Reg is in there with Fenner. Let's pretend to be French. And he kind of does the accent, at which point you think, well, this ain't going to work. And then we sort of cut, new scene, and we're, we're on the shop floor and everything is French. The girls are learning French, like from a, from a record, which is like Duolingo from the 1960s. We see Reg. And he looks like Jean-Paul Sartre. He's got a beard and a beret and a stripy shirt. We cut to Carol, who she's got the whole left bank, dark, <laughs> moody, small sunglasses on. So she she looks like Yoko Ono. <laughs> yeah, she, she, she does, yeah. Uh, then we, we see Paddy, and Paddy's wearing this glamorous backless gown, you know. Yeah, but in Paris, they wear them back to front. Yeah, that's a good line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we cut to Lily, your favourite. So as McCannon comes in... And I like, I, I'm still not sure what she was doing. She was being French. What was she doing? <laughs> I think it was some sort of like can can, <laughs> Moulin Rouge, Folly Bergère sort of well, thing. Well, again, very, very musical. And yeah. then finally, we get Barbara Windsor. We've not really mentioned Barbara Windsor, isn't this? But right, yeah. to form, Barbara Windsor comes in wearing a, just some sort of massive pointy bra, which is French. <laughs> so we ticked every single French box there. Do something French quick. Hi. <laughs> Un Maurice Chevalier sur le pont d'Avignon, le Moulin Rouge, and the Eiffel Tower. Oh, le café break. Arrêtez le travail, mademoiselle. Tout de suite. The good thing about this, obviously, looking back 60 years later, is it's still okay to take the mick out of the French. Uh, we're still on safe ground there. Fortunately, it wasn't uh, like Nigerian fashion that you had to pretend to be or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The <laughs> it works. The American comes in and he's charmed by them. And I, I must admit, when I'm looking at my notes here, uh, and I've written down, it's only a matter of time before he starts speaking French, <laughs> which is exactly what happens in about three minutes. 
<laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, he, he was. He was charmed. He loved it. He thought this this French workmanship was going to work. Uh, yeah, he, he didn't actually look at any of the workmanship. <laughs> he just goes, "Well, they're French. Obviously, it's going to be great." So <laughs> there's quite a lot of fun with the French thing. Uh, at one point, Lily is eating eats a snail. She's like, "Oh, what are the best I've ever had." Then she finds out the snails. Oh, I thought they were whelks. Yeah, like whelks. As if that's like. so much better. <laughs> yeah, like, snails are disgusting, but yeah, if it's been raised underwater, it's fine. I did like uh, when Lily does something kind of un- bizarre and Fenner's trying to explain it. He says, sorry, she had a bit of a traumatic incident. Her aunt's pen was lost in the garden of her uncle. <laughs> <laughs> Which even like... 50 years later when I was learning French they still had those sorts yeah. of phrases and it still worked as a gag. Her monkey got stuck in a tree. <laughs> yes. I like that. I thought that was about as subtle as you're going to get in here. Yeah. So the yes, the American says, "Oh, I studied I studied French at Yale and starts speaking in French and obviously it all falls all crumbles." The American there no, he's not American, is he? <laughs> no, he's not. No, he <laughs> didn't think so. Yeah, no, impossibly glamorous guy. to get an American actor. So who was it? Was it just some sort of British? He's a he's a pretty well. He's just one of those kind of jobbing actors. He he's been in a few Carry On films in his day. Um, right. Okay. I can't think of his name even off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, he's uh, knocking about and all sorts of things. You you recognise his face here and there. I didn't um, recognise him, but I did recognise an, an Englishman putting on an American accent. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I have the breakdown right here. It's all been worked out in Paris at French Race. Now, this dress can be made in two hours, 57 minutes. That's just under three hours. Huh? Uh, oui. A trois heures. Qu'est-ce que c'est que flipping carver? Oh. <laughs> trois heures, indeed. Oh, what's the matter? You are French workers, and this dress can be made in three hours by French workers. Well, bon chance to them, mate. We're not going to, are we, Freya? <laughs> <laughs> oh, These girls are English. Well, what, what I thought was interesting here is, you know, the comedy in, in the rag trade comes from this tension between management and the workers. And we had not got any, like, they all seem to go along with this French thing. Like, you're right, at the end, Paddy sort of challenges the money they're going to make. But, uh, you know, they were arguing earlier over whether Carol should, should wear trousers or not. Yeah. And now suddenly they're all happy to get dressed up and pretend to be French. And there's, there's never any sort of challenge on that. It's a funny one, this, in the show in general, and I think it's a bit of a delicate balancing act in terms of how Paddy behaves. It reminded me of when we watched Bread uh, in our last series. You know, the the guys in Bread are basically benefit cheats, you know? They're not just making use of benefits, they are cheating the system. And how we bas- we lost sympathy for them at some point because of that. And I, f- I just it's flirting with that as well with Paddy's behaviour, where when she's just trying to get the best for her workers, it's fine. But when she's deliberately doing over the boss and scamming him and knowingly kind of putting his business in danger, which ultimately will lose them all their jobs, you just start to lose sympathy for her. Most episodes, it's fine. But I definitely prefer the episodes where they all have to work together to dupe the American or whoever, Someone you know. Third party. It's always funnier there. The workers and the and the bosses coming together. <laughs> well, I think you're right about that balance. And I, I, it's really difficult to look at it from 2021 and think about how that balance, you know, for the viewer in 1961, where would that balance have been? Mm. You know, if you think about the industrial relations, unions versus the boss. Yeah, I mean, how far back do you want to go? Like during the Industrial Revolution, workers were treated abominably and unions were really important. That collective bargaining was really important for, Mm. you know, for a fair wage and for safety. But, you know, way back then, the balance was very different. I think, you know, a big turning point after the war, the the 1945 Labour government, you know, they established the NHS and the welfare state and all those sorts of things. And I think that was a big turning point. But then after this, if you think about the 70s, There was almost an idea in the popular consciousness that the unions had got too much power. Yeah. Tail was wagging the dog. And so, yeah, who governs Britain? Britain was known as the sick man of Europe. And so it was almost like the unions or the sort of attitude that's personified by Paddy was crippling British business. You know, it was doing Fenner down and no money could be made by anyone. So here in 1961, we're somewhere in between those two. You know, we're back to having a conservative government. 
there's this sort of caricature that the Labour Party are the unions, you know, the TUC ran the Labour Party. But that was propagated by the right wing press. And I think if you were a working class person working in a factory like this, you would have a lot more sympathy for Paddy and the girls than you might yeah. have for Fenner. I can't tell you in 1961 the attitude where it sat and there was probably a whole range of attitudes amongst the people watching. But I, I would imagine that balance was quite difficult to strike even then. Yeah, and I think this show is written for those people. It's written for the working class audience. The writers were from pretty working class backgrounds themselves and had worked in factories and things like that. Uh, they, you know, they, they wanted to bring that to it. So I definitely the intent is for us to be sympathetic with them. And I think, yeah, perhaps to my modern eyes, it just they go over a line a couple of times. And it's particularly interesting to compare that to a, they remade this in 1977 where it was things were totally different, but they're using the same scripts uh, largely. That does make a big difference, and they do have to acknowledge it. And there's a bit more in that later uh, incarnation that it, th these jobs didn't exist anymore. A little seamstress factory with six employees just didn't exist. Yeah. And Fenner is going out of business every week in that show, like in that later series, where in this in this original show he's doing a good job and in. in and what we what we're missing in this first series, I think, that they do get in the later seventies one, is seeing Fenner profit from all this. Yeah. Because we don't see him driving around in his new Jaguar or going home to his big house or going on a, a foreign holiday or something like that, you know. And I think they could have just highlighted that a bit more or made it clear. There's another couple of examples in the second uh, iteration where you see he's diddling people as well, like he's on the make. So he's doing over the, the buyers. And so Paddy's going to do him over kind of thing. And then that's kind of also how she gets away with so much stuff in terms of like, they just never do any work and they're always on break and stuff like that because she knows all his skeletons as well. So he can't really say anything. And I think we're missing that in these early series, mm. but I think we don't need them in the early series because just having the workers stand up for their rights, particularly women, is enough at that point. Well, I think that's really interesting, the difference in 1961 and 1975, just in terms of how to pitch this concept. Can I ask you about Wild Wild Women, which yes. uh, you showed me an episode of that, because I think that that's relevant here as well. So t just tell listeners about that. So Wild Wild Women was made in 1969. It only did one series, and it was a, a spin-off of the rag trade, essentially. It was a period-setting rag trade. It's the rag trade in 1901 or 1902 or whatever it was. And the lead was Barbara Windsor. So, they, you know, obviously they'd worked with her before. We'll talk about that a little bit as well. And she'd become a bit more of a star by that point. So they made her the star. They got Pat Coombs in there as well. And it's basically exactly the same as Rag Trade. There's only one episode that still remains, um, which is the one I, I watched. I sent it to you as well. And it's it's just the Rag Trade, except they're wearing different costumes. <laughs> and the boss, instead of coming on, come on, I'm paying you for a, a full day. I want eight hours work. He goes, look, I'm paying you for a full day. I want 14 hours work. <laughs> that, that's basically the difference as far as I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting is that the, the, the power dynamic in 1902 was very different to 1961. So like I was saying before, you know, that's, that's, that's after the Industrial Revolution. But fr well, frankly, the workers had no rights at all then. And so there's no th there's no paddy. There's no shop steward. There's no yeah. th there's no organization. Th there's no ability to stand up to the boss. So anything that they're creating there is out of time. And it, yeah, it just doesn't really work. It doesn't feel like it's works in that time period and also the boss is a bit harder and harsher and it's like okay probably would have been in reality but perhaps for that to work in that time period you need a weak character in that role well i think we should get something extra for the coronation what must be mad i'm in business i mean i'd go bankrupt if i paid out a bonus every time there was a coronation no <laughs> limey it's enough to make you want to go on strike strike who said the word strike Oh, God. I warn you, the next person who mentions that word will be subject to instant dismissal. Strike indeed. Can you imagine what the country would be like if women were allowed to strike? Yeah, men would have to go without. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it was a, uh, the, the episode we saw. I mean, it, it's not good and it, it didn't last. I'll be honest with you, Alan. I didn't make it to the end of the episode. I watched about 15 minutes of it. And I thought, yeah, I've got that. I've got the gist of this. <laughs> but interesting that Barbara Windsor was involved in that because she was in the rag trade. And in the first series of the rag trade, 
they have the principal character that we've talked about, and then they have about a half a dozen other women working just kind of in the background. And what I really like about series one specifically is how much of an ensemble that feels. Those women are involved, they're getting the odd line, they're not uh, Sheila Hancock, they're not kind of being the focus, centre of attention, but they're drawn in, you know, with a, the episode where one of them has, a Anne Beach has her baby there, and mm-hmm. even though it's her baby, you know, it's the other characters that are dealing with it for the most part, but she's there, she's involved. It feels like really good writing. And the actors they've got in are not some extras they're sticking in the background. Anne Beach was already pretty well established at that point. Barbara Windsor was a real young up-and-comer. Uh, Judy Kahn was there, who she was, yeah, a young up-and-comer. And she went on to break America, you know. She married Burt Reynolds, for God's sake. I mean, how American do you want to get? America! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and, and it's really interesting because that's kind of lost in series two. We come back in series two and those background girls have all changed. Yes, they were, they were different girls. And, yes. But, but then but we didn't seem to get any sort of introduction to them in the same way. Yeah, they're not used as much at all. And I don't know why that is. I, don't, they, they, I always just wanted to focus on, uh, you know, the, the principles. Maybe it was a money thing. Maybe they didn't have to pay them as much. Maybe, yeah. It's very, very possible. You know, they, but definitely those first series women, they were, I, they were actors, not bit players. But then in series three, Sheila Hancock and Esme Cannon left. Yeah. Now, I don't know the exact circumstances of these. And as I say, series three is lost. Series three is gone. It's, it's lost to the ether. And I don't know much about it. I've, I've seen a few kind of plot synopses. So they brought Barbara Windsor back as a principal character. Ah, but they, she's got a different character name to the character she played in the first series. So theoretically, it's not the same character. And I know that the plot line is that she's a love interest for Reg and they get engaged and, and that sort of thing. Right. And according to the Barbara Windsor telling this story, she said that uh, they said to Reg Varney, oh, we're going to introduce a love story for you. Do you any ideas who, who could do it? And he says, oh, what about that little blonde bit that was in the first series? <laughs> so um, that's how Barbara that Windsor tells the story. Tawdry. I'm sure Reg Varney was a lot classier about it. <laughs> uh, so that's obviously good for her. She'd become a bit more established by that point. Still a little bit pre-carry on. She was becoming a well-established name. And, and it's interesting how many of these girls had been in... Uh, there was a play in the very late 50s, more like early 60s, called Things Ain't What They Used To Be, which was a cockney kind of musical knockabout spivs and prostitutes kind of characters. And uh, Miriam Carlin had been in it, Barbara Windsor had been in it, and Beach, I think, was in it. It tracks to this kind of working class cockney kind of feel to it. <clears throat> was there any sort of link with, with, with the producers? Not not as far as I know, but um, there's, there's definitely some connections there with the actors. So perhaps it's just, well, we know they can do it. <laughs> we know they can do this kind of uh, this kind of character. We've we've mentioned him several times, but we've not really talked about Reg Varney. Yeah, let's uh, let's cover him off. Yeah, I feel like one day we will be doing on the buses. I, I'm sure we'll go into more detail then. So I'll give you a bit of an overview of Reg Varney. He was working class lad who um, learned how to play piano. His dad was a piano player, and um, he he just had a bit of a natural ear for it, and that was his way into show business. Started playing piano in music halls and cinemas and and that sort of thing, and uh, served in the war. He was in the Royal Engineer but did do some kind of I don't think he was part of Ensor but he was like performing as well during the war and then just got into music hall he, he had a double act with Benny Hill in the 40s um, at one point right. and that's interesting so, I didn't know that uh, yeah, just to kind of establish himself as a solid music hall performer. And the rag trade was very much his big break. It was his first major TV role. So uh, uh, my question is, how old was Reg Varney when this was made? And the reason I'm asking that is, this is a decade before On the Buses. Mm-hmm. He looked so much younger in this. Like, yeah. he looks like a kid. Also, inc- incidentally, before you answer my question, he looks very much like Paul Whitehouse. I've never thought that about mm-hmm. Reg Varney before, but in this, his sort of youthful looks, he looks like a young Paul Whitehouse. I didn't think that. It was interesting, particularly because I've seen Harry Enfield and Paul Whitehouse do on the buses spoofs, um, <laughs> and Paul Whitehouse always plays Jack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Harry Enfield plays Reg Varney. How old was he? That's another question. So in 1961, when this show started, he would have been 45 years old. That's ridiculous. <laughs> I would have said, I would have guessed late 20s. Yeah, this character's obviously supposed to be younger, but even in On the Buses, where he was in his 50s by the time that started, that character's supposed to be about 33 or something, you know? It's, yeah. And and you get away with it more here because the, the screen transfer isn't as good. The, you know, you're watching this on a 12-inch CRT, it's fine. <laughs> it's not like HD where you can see every wrinkle, is it? 
Yeah. I think he was a, a kind of a music hall star waiting for for a, a, a something like that. And and, and really, Reg Varney only got 10 years, like, because I guess he was late to the party. He got 10 years as a TV star. He did, he did this. And then in 1966, he did a show called Beggar My Neighbor with Peter Jones. And the concept of that, and this is really 60s as well, very similar, that these two neighbors, Reg Varney and Peter Jones, their wives are sisters. So they're kind of connected and they're neighbors. The Reg Varney character is like the, he's like the factory fitter and the Peter Jones character is the junior executive. But because it's the 60s, the fitter is earning a lot more money from working class stock, but he's actually doing a lot better financially speaking. So it's like, it's keeping up with the Joneses, but it's been thrown on its head a little bit. And, I see. And that's a really nice setup actually for a, for a show. That's really interesting. And again, very of its time, very 1960s. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I found that very interesting. I hadn't, um, I've never seen that before. I watched a little bit of that. And of course, bringing back uh, Reg Varney and Peter Jones together and the, the wives are Pat Coombs and June Whitfield. Oh, that's a so cast, it, isn't it? It's a hell of a cast, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, June, before I know we're talking about Reg Varney, we'll come back to him, but in one of the Rag Trade episodes in Series 2, June Whitfield was a great guest appearance in that. I think she's brilliant in that. There's there's loads of little guest appearances and, and they are a bit hit and miss. There's quite a few musical stars that, that just pop up and they haven't got a lot of TV credits, but you know they have connections with Ronald Wolf, I guess. And um, Ronnie Barker turns up in the in the very last episode, I think it is, of Series 2. Yeah, obviously before he was uh, particularly big. So just Sorry, come back, back to, to Reg Varney. Reg Varney I, I, yeah. I took you off there. Back to Reg. So yeah, obviously he did On the Buses, started in 1969, and, and that ran to 73. He kind of dropped out. He wasn't even in the last series of On the Buses. And he did a sitcom called Down the Gate, in which he was a fishmonger working on a market, and that didn't do very well. There was a couple of attempts, one in the 60s, then one in the early 70s, to do a kind of sketch show around him, which makes sense. Music hall. Yeah, but just didn't have particularly big success. And basically it. After On the Buses, he, 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 did, the, he did the classic of like going to Australia and doing a tour down there as a one-man Well, that's interesting, because I was just show. about to say there, is there a shades here of Harry H. Corbett where he was typecasting this main character? And because Harry H. Corbett went to Australia to reprise his character as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So was yeah. he just stuck in that on the buses persona? I think a little bit. Definitely he was stuck in that kind of working class cheeky chappy role and he's 65 years old. <laughs> it's just like... Yeah. So, well, yeah, exactly. So he's, he's a lot with. older than I thought he was. I think that was kind of... he. If he got in there 20 years earlier, it might have been able to do something else. In fact, you know what it really made me think of watching him in The Rag Trade? was reminding me of what we did uh, last time out when I was watching all the stuff in the 70s, uh, vehicles for David Jason. And yes. How great he was at the physical stuff and the slapstick stuff. And I was just thinking, David Jason as this character in the rag trade, it, it was a bit too young in the early 60s, but then it, like, he would have been great at that. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right, he would have slotted into that role very well. And then I thought, wouldn't he have made a great Stan Butler as well from On the Buses? Hmm? He would have been able to do that real. And he would have been much more age appropriate. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. The only other thing I know about Reg Varney, a little trivia element, is that he was the first person to use a cash machine. Uh, <laughs> I famous, think I did know that. I think that, thing about that him. sounds familiar. Yeah, basically when they installed the first cash machine, uh, it was near where he lived in 1967. He was already a big star. So they were like, on the phone, I guess, to his agent, look, just pop down the corner, do a little photo op for us. And Reg Varney will open anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. come and cut a ribbon and so he was a, the first sort of official use of a cash machine i tell you what i, I listen I, th this is a, a tangent too far but in 1967 how did a cash machine work <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i presume there was a little man sat behind <laughs> yeah exactly exactly no, listen that is too far as a tangent even for me let's not ignore that question <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's Reg Varney. I'm, I'm sure we'll 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 look him in more detail at some point. We'll definitely yeah. do on the bus because he is a fascinating character, actually. Uh, but yeah, on the buses seems an inevitable one for us, isn't it? Yeah. Speaking of Reg Varney, I mean, one thing we haven't really talked about too much in in this episode that we were looking at um, a little bit that we kind of happened earlier on, we we skipped right over it. Um, what I what I want to call Varney's law that if if ever there is a, a spray can or a f shaving foam or anything, it will spurt into Reg Varney's face. <laughs> <laughs> that is, and so we have a whole thing with some sort of setting cream or something they have messing with their hair. And they have this great prop that is like frothing out this foam. 
Mm. And it's always remarkable to me on these things when these props work uh, quite well. (laughs) It's a bit of a bugbear of mine. And I think I might have even mentioned it with Faulty Towers and that sort of thing where how slack things can be on on sitcoms with, with in terms of farce and physical comedy. As much as Faulty Towers was drilled and and, re- and edited, you can still see through all these cracks. I and I think getting upset about the rat in the biscuit tin. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think the rag trade does it really well because it has us. It manages to evoke a stage mentality, and so I think you're a little bit more forgiving of it. It, it feels more spontaneous. It feels yes. like they're just performing on stage rather than, yes. you know, they're taking nine or ten takes. Yes, and I'm not sure exactly what the process is. I noticed um, a bit in one episode I watched where I noticed a continuity area where Fenner was suddenly holding something that he hadn't been uh, in, a, in a cut. So obviously they would, there must have been a, the occasional case of doing a couple of takes or maybe just cutting a joke out or something that didn't quite land. But for the most part, this is pretty, like, yeah, as it was... You can see Rejvani desperately getting his face into position for where something's going to spurt at him or, you know, that sort of thing. And I think for the most part, he does a good job. And that's kind of like the stage experience you want, I guess. Because he was the least experienced actor on the set in terms of TV, you know, he was, and obviously they wanted him for his comic abilities. I still can't believe he was 45. <laughs> yes. So that's our episode, really. And this is one where kind of nobody wins, you know, but often it's uh, it's a matter of, um, you know, they'll, they'll accidentally set fire to the clothes and then someone will walk in and go, oh, this is burn couture. This is all the rage in Italy. I'll take I'll take 10 dozen. Hot couture. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's always some nonsense like way to wrap it up so they'll kind of win at the end or yeah sometimes Fenner will get the better of the workers you know get caught yeah we, I see, we saw that in a couple of the episodes it's, it's a sort of all's well that ends well <laughs> and even though we've got this tension between the boss and the workers there's it, always a kind of okay everybody's back to normal see you next week yes exactly yeah which is exactly what this was designed to be. And, and certainly, like I say, I've watched it in a box set sense, which is not the way to do it because it's very repetitive. Everyone gets their fair share of comeuppance. It's not that one side always wins. And I think that, yeah. that, balance, that balance is well struck and I suspect is what made it popular. Yeah, yeah. So just to talk about the legacy of a little bit, um, there was a, a stage uh, version while the show was still you know, a big deal, 1962. It didn't do particularly anything special. Sheila Hancock released a record, uh, you know, of her singing some kind of cheeky Cockney song, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, the, the, the principal legacy. Well, the, there is another one. There was a Norwegian remake in the early 90s, which is, you know, it's a nice little retirement fund for Chesney and Wolf, I guess. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah I, I don't know if it was particularly uh, well renowned. <laughs> But uh, yeah, really, the legacy of the rag trade was the remake in the 70s. And obviously, we've referred to it quite a few times, but I think it, it definitely deserves a little bit more of a close. Well, let me ask you, because you're saying remake. And you said they were using the same scripts. It's not just a shot for shot remake, is it? No, but I, I like, look, before I went into this, I knew that they'd done a, a 70s version of it and that there was a couple of the same characters. It wasn't a remake as such. It was a continuation and same writers. Right. So I was thinking, okay, yeah, they've just kind of rebooted it. I see put some new cast in it. Yeah. That's what I was expecting. I come to watch it and it's like, oh, these are exactly the same plots. <laughs> Not word for word, but the same beats, the same gags, you know, they've been rewritten, they've been tweaked, and there are some new scripts, but there are lots of reused things, and that was not what I was expecting. But I guess these shows weren't repeated back then. These shows weren't seen, and and by the 70s, they weren't really showing these black and white things. The, the BBC were deleting them, they were wiping the tapes. This is a, we'll remake them in colour. So we can get rid of yep. the old ones. No one will ever want to watch those black and white ones again. We'll create a new record of it. Exactly. but An upgrade. They, they don't seem to have addressed the fact that times have changed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but like, so you were saying earlier, I mean, the place of the trade union had changed by the 70s. The, the, the place of women in the workplace had changed. The women in the home had, had changed uh, to, to, a, to some extent, not as much as now. Well, I did a bit of research on... on, on well, what we might call women's industrial relations. And the big incident that you and listeners may have heard of is the Ford Sewing Machinist Strike 1968, better known as the film Made in Dagenham. Yes. 
And that's that's quite a, an iconic, well, they made a film out of it, but it's quite an iconic dispute. And that was 1968. So that was in between the original run of this and the, the remake. So you had all these people who worked for Ford. And the men worked in the factories, you know, putting the seats into the cars, whereas the women worked at the other side of the factory, sewing the upholstery onto the seats. Mm -hmm. And there was a big regrading of all the employees. And of course, the female employees, no, sorry, not the female employees, the machinists were regraded a much lower grade than the people who were fitting the seats into the cars. Now, again, just a coincidence that all of those were women and all of those were men. But it just what this meant was that the women were going to take a pay cut and the men were going to take a pay rise as part of this regrading. Great. And obviously the women said, well, you know, we're skilled workers as well. What we're doing here isn't, it, it's not just anyone could do this. It requires skill in just the same way. Yeah. They went out on strike. It was a, a kind of seminal moment in industrial relations because this was a female led strike. And, um, you know, initially wasn't very popular with male colleagues because effectively they were taking <coughs> their money away. What I found really interesting uh, about the rag trade um, is that, you know, and they, and they get a few laughs out of this that Paddy refers to the union as her brothers. I need to confer with my brothers. The, the, that the language of trade unions is masculine like that that tells you all you need to know there were so few women in the unions that they didn't they weren't even included in the language so. yeah that's a really good point yeah the only other the other example i came up with which is an older example but indulge me this is from 1888 which was the match right. girls strike in bryant and may in london basically the girls who made matches they used to get this um affliction called fuzzy jaw which was because they were inhaling phosphorus and, you know, they went on strike to get safer conditions, basically. Mm. What I found out was that they marched on Parliament, these girls, and they were all aged between sort of 13 and 20. They were kids. Mm. And, you know, the police harassed them and pushed them around, but they eventually got what they wanted. But, it, but really what they wanted was the right to organise, the right to unionise. So the concessions that management made were that they could eat their food in a different room so they weren't inhaling all this phosphorus, which was, which was good. But really it was the right to have a union union that was the big concession that the employer did not want to concede mm. and that was the big change so that it wasn't just that victory but an ability to fight future fights yeah and that's what we see in the rag trade that's what we see we <clears> see <throat> that organization we see that well, brotherhood that's what you've just sort of, you've just reminded me of another point i wanted to make actually in terms of like having that sympathy with paddy or losing it is when she decides when fenner is giving us some trouble she'll all right all right you want to play by the book i'll play by the book and she, we're going to work to rule and so she gets the rule book out and go like right well we need to have fire drills at this time we need to have, we need to have a first aid kit with this in it and basically to slow down everything and and frustrate fenner until Fenner goes, all right, I'll give you an extra two quid a week. And she goes, all right, fine. We don't need a first aid kit. We don't need uh, health and safety rules. It's all right. And that's when you lose the sympathy for her. <laughs> because yeah, yeah. it isn't about getting better conditions. It's just about getting more money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is, you know, important. But <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm conscious that we are two um, white men having this conversation. Yeah, but, you know, well. I think there's still work <clears throat> to be done. <laughs> that was very good of you. <laughs> Anyway, a little bit of politics. That's political <laughs> enough for us. Let's get back to the uh, slapstick. In the 70s, let's get back to this 70s remake. Well, first of all, the first step of that was the BBC commissioned a pilot. It's basically what happened was the BBC didn't pick it up, but they managed to sell it to, to London Weekend Television. So that was who paid for it. And interesting thing about that is that it is basically the same setup as we get in that later series. Peter Jones is returned as Fenner. Miriam Carlin is 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 not to be found. Well, that was the big miss for me. There was a, another actor playing a different character, yeah, but Gabe essentially Brown. the same character, that shop steward character. And yes. yeah, I, I, I mean her, no disrespect, but she wasn't no, anywhere near as good. It wasn't the same. Well, I really liked her, actually, Gay Brown, in that role. I recently saw her... She, Gay Brown's one of those people who like, turns up in all sorts of things. You go, oh, yeah, I know her from that. I recently saw her in an episode of Only Fools and Horses that we were looking at. Uh, last time so uh, i think she did a really good job and i think if you'd never seen miriam carlin do it you'd be like oh yeah that's really good but you no, i think that the character in that pilot was just a little bit more aggressive and, mm -hmm. and and just just not as charming basically and i think that illustrates what a tightrope miriam carlin was walking in that character because as you say she is obstructive she's a streperous but she has charm, you know, and you're yeah. you're kind of instinctively um, sympathetic. Well, I would argue, having watched all the LWT series, that 
she sort of falls down the other side of that line anyway. Uh, Miriam Carlin does. And uh, I have to say, after I watched... So I watched all the Rag Trade, and then I watched the whole LWT series, and then I went back and watched a few of the earlier episodes before we started talking about this, just to get my head back into that. And I'm very glad I did, because I think I turned a lot more negative on this because I watched the later show. Um, yeah. and, and it just doesn't work as well. It, it's just not as good. But just to address that, that pilot episode... One of the more notable elements of it is that the the foreman, the Reg Varney type character, is played by a young Tony Robinson. Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, Baldrick before he was Baldrick. Yeah, it's quite sweet to see him, and I think he did a really good job actually. Blimey, Mister Fetty, you've got a nerve! You're making fifty percent profit. Where'd you learn to lie like that? Listen, enjoy our shop steward negotiating a rate. <laughs> I mean, obviously he is, he was, as we've learned, he was significantly younger than Reg Varney. <laughs> but he does a good job of being quite <clears throat> boyish, is that the right word? Sort yeah. of um, naive and inexperienced, and so the, the girls can take advantage of his uh, better nature. Yeah, and, and just because of his small stature, that kind of helps oh, yeah. work with it as well. And, uh, and, and they can like literally pick him up <laughs> and bully him. Uh, so I think that's a bit of a miss, actually, that he's not in the show that got eventually made, because um, the guy they got for that is Christopher Beanie just doesn't have the charm <laughs> frankly <laughs> it just wasn't uh, yeah it didn't do anything for me uh they also have in in that pilot episode they have uh, an indian character i was uh, just gonna say i noticed that it was a multiracial cast um you know if we're talking about in 1961 how this was uh groundbreaking in terms of female characters empowered female characters then mm -hmm. you know they were yeah they were bringing in a multiracial cast in the 70s which I guess this is a similar theme. Yeah, so the, the Indian woman who appears in the pilot is Jamila Massey, who went on to be the Indian woman in Mind Your Language. Uh, so uh, that's obviously a high point of her career. I also noticed that this pilot was a bit racier. You know, we see we see one of the women in the in a bra and then in her underwear, yeah. and, and it's, it's like, okay, well, this didn't happen last time because I remember in the 1961 version, there's a scene where we see we see Carol slip, yeah, <laughs> which is really racy, which is yeah. like a, basically a skirt underneath her skirt. When did that happen? When did women stop wearing three layers of underwear underneath their clothes? <laughs> well, in between 1961 and 1975, apparently. When you can get a good nylon. Uh, material <laughs> a bit warmer i guess uh but yeah that's that is a, a big difference yeah they've they've had to ramp up from yes yeah, seeing a, a young lady slip to seeing a woman in her bra and pants that is the other big difference as well so diane langton who plays that role in the pilot is the the one person who makes the transfer to the actual series yeah so she is in the the, the full lwt series as well and i would best describe that character as we wish we had Barbara Windsor, but we haven't. So here's a knockoff. And here's her bra. <laughs> yeah. And it's so different to how Sheila Hancock plays that character. And I think that is a really massive difference. Yeah. Not just the way that the character is presented, but it's something to do with what Sheila Hancock brings to that. And I think it is that kind of, she's not just playing a dolly bird. She's not just playing a kind of mindless bimbo. Yeah. Sheila Hancock is playing a realistic sort of naive perhaps and and somewhat uneducated character but she's not playing the barbara windsor in carry on camping kind of bimbo role and it, it's a it's a huge miss and with all due respect to diane langton who does that what she's asked to do she does it fine and she does some nice little physical bits as well also, that is, this is another thing that I've always wondered about Barbara Windsor, where, uh, that they have it with Diane Langton here as well. Lots of references to her having a big boobs. You know, talking about a, a bra strap, like, oh, with where you're built, you need a rope and tackle, and, and stuff like that. It's like, but she's not got big boobs. And this is like, oh, well, I always thought about Barbara Windsor. It's like, you know, it's all very well in proportion and attractive woman and all that, but they're not big. Like, if you're going to make jokes about them being big. You know, Hattie Jakes. Quite... Hattie Jakes would be yeah. Yeah, for that joke, wouldn't she? And so that means that Diane Langton, her breasts are constantly just rammed up into this kind of cleavage that is not, not naturally formed. It just looks it's what people wanted in 1977. And, and then the other miss here that we have, obviously, we have a kind of Esma Cannon style character, this kind of older woman played by Deddy Davis. And again, it's just not the same character. And the way that the actor is portraying it is, if I may call it somewhat disparagingly, Peter Denyer acting. Um, <laughs> if you go back to our Dear John episode, just the most basic level one performance of, of the character. And I think that's in the writing as well. That character is written very differently to how Esma Cannon played it. I have to go to the market to get some pussy. 
Reese's Pieces. Your what? Reese's Pieces. Fish for my little cat. Mm. The show as a whole is lacking a physical element. It, it doesn't go down the slapstick route anywhere near as much. You're saying that they're using the same premise. This this was Wolf and Chesney, right? There was the, the same yes. same writers. No one else involved in the writing. So no. they did they did the rag trade, a couple of the things they did on the buses, and then they came back to this. That was the that was their career path, right? Yes. It feels like a, a backward step in more ways than just going back to the same material. But well, interestingly, I I was kind of down on it. I was down on it at first, and by the time I watched the whole show the whole LWT series, which is about 20 odd episodes. I, I found more in it as we went along because they stopped using those original scripts. They started writing new material and writing for the situation they had. Fenner is a bit more boisterous and, and not aggressive exactly, but angry and not rather than just frustrated and impotent. I mean, what chance have I got of making a living? I mean, how can I be expected to survive? I mean, look what you've done this morning. Nine blouses, and you're supposed to have turned out two dozen. What have I got to get you girls to produce more? Well, Mr. Fenner, I'm quite willing to negotiate a productivity deal with you, like the miners got. <laughs> I wish I'd got the miners working at this bench. They'd make blouses a lot cleaner than you lot do. No, oh, I don't know why I bother. I mean, it's just one headache after another. And that business, he's going out of business. Like, even as simple as in the first series, they have a few other background characters. Whereas by the second series, they, there are six women working in that factory. And it's the same six women all the time. Now, they do expand all those six characters to be full characters. So we have one character who is uh, um, Caribbean descent of some kind of uh, Caribbean. And it's, not hand it's handled in a very 70s way, let's put it that way. But at least they were demonstrating that there was, a, there was some sort of multi-ethnic level to London at that point. Now, you see, we operate a closed shop. Shop? Is this not a factory? Oh, yes, it is. It's just an expression we use. It's no good, Paddy. She comes from overseas. She doesn't understand the way we talk. <laughs> Then you've got um, Gillian Telforth, a young Gillian Telforth, who actually is a real highlight for me. She's, she's not really doing much comedy, but she, she feels like the most real character. Uh, and I think it's a really nice, natural performance. She's, and she's the young one, you know, she's the young girl. Yeah. And then the other character they have, in a bizarre choice, is Olive from On the Buses. <laughs> right. uh, played by Aaron, Anna Karen. But it, it is hang on, Olive sorry, it's the, the same buses. character. It is Olive. <laughs> oh, we've got a Chesney and Wolf expanded universe. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. It, it, she's got the same the, the <laughs> hair and the glasses and the, and all that and going on about how her husband won't have sex with her all the time. Just like she did for six years on On The Buses. Yeah, it's an odd choice. I guess it was just, look, that's only a few years ago. It's still popular. Let's trade in on that. You know, let's let's work that. It, it, it seems an odd choice to me, but I, I guess she fits in that environment, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you, we definitely get a bit more. And I find those elements interesting where there's one episode where there's just no work. No one will come and hire them anymore because their work is crap. And and that's very much something we see in the in this later series that in the 60s series, they go slow sometimes to make sure they're getting the most money and all that. And in the later series, their work is shoddy. I suppose and... there's an underlying assumption in the 60s series that they actually are capable and can do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everything, everything comes back low damaged. Fenner can't get any work out of him. So not only do they work slowly and badly, but they charge him a fortune to do it as well. This is what I was saying about the sick man of Europe. British industry was on its knees. It had been brought to its knees by the unions. That's what people and, thought. Well, they, they definitely address that. And they go to the point of saying, look, my buyer's not interested because he can get this for, the same, for cheaper from Hong Kong. Uh, so I like that it addresses those issues. And yeah, like I say, there is one episode where they're just hanging around. But then that becomes a problem for the workers because they're on basic minimum wage, no no bonuses. So they need the work to come in. And so then they all start working together to fool a buyer into thinking they're actually good. And I, so I kind of like that. Um, there's a whole... There's Presumably it's a lot easier than actually being good at your job. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There's an episode where, you know, they think Fenner has a heart problem, so they start being nice to him. And Paddy has to kind of acknowledge that, look, I've worked here for 18 years and, you know, he's not so bad, really. 
but but then the kind of undercurrent of that is who else is going to employ me <laughs> because I don't do any work. You know, I think she kind of realizes they're killing the golden goose and they have to kind of just pull back a little bit. Yeah, sure. I like that it addresses all that. Uh, and I, like, I feel like it found its feet a little bit more in that second series because it stopped trying to just do the 60s scripts and acknowledged the situation it was in. But it still just doesn't work on the same level at all. It just doesn't, It's just not as much fun. Well, let's summarise what we think. You've talked quite a lot there about the second iteration of this, of the rag trade. Let's, mm-hmm. you know, this episode really is about that first three series, although well, we didn't watch the third, but the first 1960s version of this. So what's your, what's your summary? The 60s one, it feels, well, sort of paradoxically, I think, feels of its time, but also ahead of its time, just on the virtue that there are women in it. <laughs> you know but in terms of the comic stylings i think it is that proto sitcom it's that early tv where they haven't quite figured out yeah. how this sort of thing works yet and i really like that as a kind of sitcom historian if i yeah. call myself that that i find that really appealing I, I i wouldn't go so far as to say i find it really funny but i find it very entertaining i think what it's trying to do it does really well and like i say the performances i think rise above the writing somewhat and I, I really find it fascinating to have that comparison of that remake in the 70s because it is just such an easy side-by-side look how things have changed and look what doesn't work anymore and look what does work now. So I think as a, from a sitcom history point of view, it's, it's, it's fascinating to find that. Uh, and then, you know, it's given, it gave us the birth of, you know, Reg Varney and Sheila Hancock and, and all that sort of thing. It's certainly, it's certainly got its place, but I think it is not, it's not remembered, uh, particularly outside of kind of sitcom nerd. No, world. it's no Steptoe, is it? Yeah, there's no, it's not Steptoe. It's not Dad's Army. And, and obviously that's because it wasn't repeated in the 80s. Yeah. Uh, ad nauseum, you know? I, I liked it. Interesting what you said there about it's not funny, but it is entertaining. And I would agree with that. There was a couple of bits that were quite cartoonish, but a couple of times I thought this is like reading a comic. And when I say when I say reading a comic, I don't mean like um, the Avengers. I don't mean an American comic. I mean it's like reading the Beano or the Dandy. Yeah. You know, it's the sort of thing you would imagine reading in in that kind of British comic. Yeah, it's the same every week. The, the jokes are telegraphed a mile away. <laughs> yeah, and you're not you're not laughing out loud. I don't think I ever laughed out loud at Desperate Dan when I was a kid. But it was <laughs> yeah. fun. It was fun, and I enjoyed it. And that's kind of how this felt. It was very stagey, and it's interesting. You told us about the music hall origins of a lot of these actors, and you can really see, now you said that that's really apparent. The the the, the milk bottle in the press joke. Yeah. You know, that's very stagey, very music hall. <laughs> I like the characters. I think, as you said, uh, particularly in that first series, which is what I watched, uh, the ensemble cast is great. The supporting mm-hmm. characters all contribute something. And I really like Paddy. I really like Miriam Carlin in that role. I like the character. I think that's quite a delicate balance to strike. Mm-hmm. And she gets it really She gets it really right. And just, just to echo that, actually, in terms of the ensemble cast and everything, to complement the writing, to say these are two you know, men <laughs> writing female characters. I think they do a very good job of that. And there is a real nice energy in that group when someone makes a bit of a dirty comment and they all go, ha <laughs> you know, it's like, it feels very real, like kind of this, like, oh, it's sort of eavesdropping into the women's conversation kind of thing. It it really does feel quite genuine and, and it has the right energy for all that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good observation, yeah. Uh, so I, I I think that's about it on the rag trade. I think we've covered that pretty nicely. Uh, and, and an interesting one. I do find it always very interesting to go back to right back to the early days to see how things have changed. Well, it'd be interesting if if any of our listeners have got any suggestions. Well, any suggestions for future episodes, but particularly in those early sixties, if there's anything, you know, of course, big caveat has to it has to be available. We have to be able to watch it, and the BBC haven't deleted the damn thing. But you know, if there's anything else that our listeners might suggest, we could uh, we could ob- watch for the next season. Then please tell us. And that's all from us this week. If you have enjoyed the show, please do recommend us to a friend and go and check out our back catalogue. We've got lots of other sitcoms that we've already talked about and a lot more to come. Next week, we will be jumping forward 20 years into the 80s for something completely different. In the meantime, you can get in touch with us on our social medias at BritcomPod on Instagram or Twitter. Thank you very much for listening and we hope you will be back again next time. 